Hey, welcome to Creative Block. We're your hosts, Gene. And V. We interview people in the animation industry about their life, work, hobbies, while we doodle jam. We asked people on Twitter if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. And today with us, we have Ian Mutchler. Hello. Yay. You guys are so professional. That was amazing. <laughs> That's what everyone says, and it's uh, definitely not off of a script. We definitely just improvise that. You guys have the cadence that you're not reading off a script, but you do need a theme song. We do have a theme song. It's from Louis Zong. <gasps> Louis Zong did his theme song? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does it sound like this? Can I give you a theme song? Yeah. Give us a new theme song. <clears throat> Gene and V, they're out there interviewing their friends and hanging out. That it. That's it. That was good. That was Thanks, actually everybody. pretty great. Hey, Clem, <laughs> uh, take Louis, throw it in the trash for this episode. <laughs> And let's use Ian's theme song instead. Gene and V, they're out there interviewing their friends and hanging out. <laughs> Everyone tweet at Louie and tell him he didn't do as good a job as me. Yeah, sorry, Louie. Sorry, Louie. Don't do that, please. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't imagine? tweet it. Don't tweet it, Louie. <laughs> Louie would be like, I barely know this guy. Yeah, Louie did a great job with the theme song. But it is going in the trash for this one. Yeah, <laughs> it is going in the trash. But anyway, hi, Ian. Hello. Thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. I've been watching a few of them. I watched Kiana's oh, yeah. and Louie's. And you guys are very yeah. good at this. It's genius. You guys just get to hang out with your friends for a while and catch up with them. It's genius and venius. <gasps> oh my gosh. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> do you, you need to do something with that. <laughs> this is money left on the table. Genius and venius. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Tell us who you are. Tell us what you do. Of course. How did you spell genus? <laughs> it would probably be like, it would be like gene. Oh, that's way better. Yes. And then V. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's way better. All right. Pretend I did that. <laughs> Ian. Ian, yes. My name is Ian Mutchler. I'm a storyboard artist. I was at Warner Brothers. I have worked at DreamWorks, Disney, and Sega. All kinds of different fun things. I do comics on the side. I just like making people laugh. But I'm currently in the animation industry, and I'm uh, good friends with Gene and V. Mm -hmm. I would hope so. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) If you're not friends with Gene and V, what's the point? Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Ian, I kind of like, I know this is kind of like a basic question, but I think I like to ask it because it's like a good way to start our guests talking about their life and what was kind of like your when did you kind of like realize that you really loved drawing oh my gosh yeah i've always been drawing it was one of those things where like i would draw comics and try to make my friends laugh and then i would staple them and put them up on the board so right next to the dry erase board was like a oh that's really like a cork board and i would take them and put them up there and then during class people would just go and grab them and read the comics really oh that's so cute that's so great (laughs) I know. My dream was to be a new... I wanted to do newspaper comics. That's really what Mm. I wanted to do, was newspaper comics. And then I decided, maybe I should expand my horizons. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I don't want to do this. It's not a lucrative career. Could you imagine? I could have the next Garfield. I could be chilling. Jim Davis had it right. But here I am. Well, you got grubby. You got grubby. But we'll we'll talk about grubby more later. Yeah. When are you... How old were you when you were, like, uh, doing these little comics, by the way? Oh, this was, like... um, This was middle school to high school. Okay. But I was making them in elementary school, but I have a, a vision. Did you guys have intermediate school? Uh, like junior high? I don't know. Yeah, I think it was junior. It was fourth and fifth grade were separated, and it was called intermediate school. And that's where I, I really remember fourth and fifth grade. I did it. But I was really okay. just trying to make my friends laugh. And I was watching cartoons once, and then I was like, wait, maybe I can do that. Like, it was like, oh, what yeah. is the best avenue to make people laugh? Mm-hmm. And, that, and at the time, I thought it was newspaper comics. I'm like, everyone reads newspaper comics. This is it. This is the only yeah. way people will look at it and smile. And uh, I was wrong. But no. I was when when I was in college, I was animating, and my professor walked behind me and watched me animate a little bit. And he was like, "You're not going to be an animator." And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm only paying a ton of money for this, but that's fine because I really thought that the major was going to be animation. I would just be an animator." And he was like, "You should mm-hmm. go into boarding." And I was like, "Oh, okay." And I oh, I see. Yeah, that was like his his train of thought. It was he was like, "All right, I'm going to pivot this kid into storyboarding." And I was like, "Well, why?" And he was like, "Well, you like making those comics, right?" And I was like, "Oh, I guess I do." <laughs> and here we are. 
That's so interesting. Yeah. I was wondering, like, kind of how did you um, like in so in high school, still in high school, you wanted to make comics or how did you kind of like realize that you were maybe going to pursue animation? Yeah, um, it was one of those things where it came time like we would have classes dedicated to like picking college like they would have like in the library we would sit in the library and you would have to go and grab a book that just had a list of colleges and so you'd go and look at all the lists oh and so God. i came home and i was like mom i looked at this list of like art schools and like i have no clue what i'm doing so she sat down and helped me and we figured out what major would be best for me within like an art school and saw and tried to see the potential of me going there and that's when i figured out animation was like a major that you could do because it was one of those things where like we grew up with the internet but there was still so many unknowns. Like I didn't know how like cartoons were made. I didn't know that storyboarding was a thing until college. Like I didn't get it. Whereas now people are like exposed to the ins and outs of the animation industry. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. way earlier than I guess I ever knew. So like people can now start working towards these goals way sooner than I guess I realized I could, you know? It's crazy. Yeah. It's like oh, talking yeah. to some, like even talking to Kiana, it's like, I feel like, yeah, younger artists just have that advantage because there's so much more information. And, but the the older our guests are the the more curvy the road was because it was just like yeah. they didn't know they didn't know that this was even possible for them oh my That's god it, it, it's so interesting how secretive industries can be mm -hmm. because i feel like animation's not even the only one but i think just animation's so prevalent on social media just because artists kind of need to share that kind of thing yes to where it's like animators are putting their art out there and then they're also saying i'm storyboard artists where like maybe people in the the chef, like the cooking industry right like they might not be able to share exactly what they do and you'll never know about it right but i think now it's more accessible than ever i feel like if you're really like looking for the hashtags and everything like obviously and you know artists will follow other artists because you're like interested in other mm -hmm. people's crafts i guess yes mm. i totally agree so i i we, I was at the library looking at SAT books, or not SAT books, but college books, and I was like, oh, these art these arts colleges. And I was like, well, I don't want to stay in West Virginia, because West Virginia is where I'm from. I was like, I don't necessarily want to stay in West Virginia. I want to get out of here. So what's the farthest I could go without being too far away from my parents? And it was Georgia. So I ended up at the Savannah College of Art and Design in Georgia for animation. SBA, right? Yes. 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 I love that we have a lot of um, SBA guests. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Oh, which one? Wait, which college was it that you, that you said? SVA? Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, no. I didn't go okay. there. I did tour there. I was like, ooh, let me see it. Uh, they had, if I remember correctly, well, all the SVA people who watch this can either attest or deny it. But there, when I toured SVA, there was one room for animation and like one computer room. And they had maybe two Cintiqs that they had to share. Oh, my for God. The animation oh. department. And I was like, oh, no freaking way. And they didn't really give any scholarships. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's really interesting that you mentioned that you grew up in West Virginia, right? Yes. Um, how was kind of like your exposure to cartoons and or art in general, like growing up there? Because I feel like personally for me, the first time that I realized that maybe I could draw cartoons as a career was because I happened to have lived in like close to LA and I feel like it's a much more like prevalent thought out here oh, in yeah. like LA area that it's like oh yeah this is a career you can do but I feel like when you grow up somewhere else it's like a little bit less of like something that is like evident I guess oh 100% no I, I I think you're totally right on the money I think if you're from the area where it all happens it's much more it's just much easier to understand I guess what people can do because you have friends or you might know somebody or a friend of a friend or an aunt's friend went into this industry, you know? Mm. So it's one of those situations where like, it was just research, you know, on my end, I do think it's, it's tough because when I graduated SCAD, it was like, I needed to go to LA, you know, like once I left, it was like, okay, LA is where I need to be. Cause that's where all the jobs I'm interested in currently are. So it was just a lot of like talking and guessing, you know, we had professors who worked in the industry in LA that could kind of like talk about it to be like, oh man, I almost got this show, but now I'm here teaching. And it's like, wow, I could do that. Right. I could <laughs> almost have a show and leave. I could you know? almost have a show. <laughs> it uh. was definitely like a, you know, teaching is what you do after. But um, yeah, so it, yeah, it's, I think it's much harder if you're on the, on the East coast for sure uh, with yeah. this industry. 
Yeah, there's just not as many opportunities, unfortunately. No, and if there are, they they might not be union in the way of like they take mm-hmm. advantage of you in different ways. It's sad. I hope I hope the best. I have a lot of friends over there on the East Coast yeah. who are still making it work. Mm-hmm. How was kind of like your path into going into college like did you have to do a portfolio or oh my god oh my god you like reach into my brain i forgot i had to do all that yes <laughs> oh my god did you get like buried trauma yes oh my gosh like i never think about like the before college did you guys go to art college too i don't quite remember yeah 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 which one did you go to gene i went to an art institute in the suburbs of chicago and like yeah, I had to put together a portfolio and it was pathetic. I, because like they, they wanted, you know, like a nice smattering of different things. Wow. And oh, this is really funny. I don't think I, I want to hear. <laughs> I, I like, I, you need it, you know, you, you got to have like life drawing and stuff, but I didn't have any life drawing. And, and so I just like sketched some like gestures. I was like, ah, whatever. Yes. Just like some shitty bodies that, and I made it look like it was like really like, you know, of the moment and shit. Yes. And then I just like traced a photo of my dad and, <laughs> and, and I, and I like, I traced a photo and I made it look really artsy. I did some like cross hatching and I called it, I like called it like father. And then I put that in my portfolio <laughs> and I ended up getting a scholarship. I ended up getting, I, I, it wasn't like a lot of money, but it oh was like God, seven fun. grand or something. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it, and I was and my the the guy that got the the real scholarship there was like another one that was a lot more money ended up yeah. being one of my cl- closest friends and has worked with me on Planet Panic and shit and so it was just like a really funny I was like you got that big scholarship I was like god damn it but his portfolio <laughs> his portfolio was way like fancier than mine like it looked nicer but yeah mine oh my god mine was shit and yeah I completely forgot I forget about that too I forget about that process of like I want to see that dad photo or that dad gesture uh, that you did so I, I have bad. it I have it somewhere but yeah I it's... did one I can actually draw it this is one that I Please did. do. I'm pretty pot so I took a photo of myself. So the photo is me sitting on a chair like this with a okay. with a sketchbook cuz of course every artist had to draw them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's that's who you are. So uh, I'm sitting here. So this is a real photo. So pretend this is a photograph. I'm here. And then I had my television that I would play all my video games on in my room. And I had mm-hmm. all my little cartoon characters coming out oh, of the TV. Oh, yeah. Dude. My Which God, makes the classic. no sense. It makes no sense. I'm sitting there drawing on a sketchbook. Why are they coming out of the TV? Because it's your like... You're like willing them into existence, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, I want everyone to see my little creations. Hey, it's either that or it's like your head and it would be like bursting open and all of your yes. like ideas ah! are like that out, out of Jimmy's head kind of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the other uh that's the other option. Oh, that's, so that's really funny. funny. I love the like I love that, like, you know, when you're, like, a kid um, and you're trying to think of, like, these, like, big concept ideas to, like, go into art school. Like, I mean, it's just because, you know, like, you've only been exposed to so much in so little time, right? So you end up, like, creating these, like, metaphors, like, these visual metaphors that are, like, you're like, oh, I'm so smart and creative. And it's just, (laughs) like, (laughs) like, something that you've seen, like... (laughs) probably two years ago in like a manga or something a hundred percent right i forgot we even had to do this kind of stuff v did you have to do this did you have to do like a whole portfolio to apply to college i I did because in france a lot of the schools are like uh semi-public or public and i mean the ones that i wanted to go to because obviously these schools were the ones that everyone wanted to go to because they were like because it was a lot less money for education to pay so but that means that like a lot of people wanted to go and the entrance exams were really difficult so Oof. um there was like a lot of competition to get in and i the first time i tried right after high school didn't get me anywhere and then so i had to do like one year after school of like these like preparation art schools that are like basically just focused on like foundation drawing and then i did another portfolio and then, like, yeah, I managed to get You had it. to do two portfolios? Yeah, the first one was, like, well, for all the schools, but I didn't get anywhere. So I showed it to, like, the preparation art school. And they were like, okay, you can, you can like, you're accepted to, like, the preparation. Okay. And then you do another one to get in, like, the actual school. Because I went to Goblin. No way. Oh, I had mm-hmm. a feeling. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. The French, the French know what they're doing ah! in terms of art. 
Oh my gosh. Every time I see a drawing from UV, I'm like, oh, beautiful. Yes. Perfect. Anatomically yeah. correct. The gestures are me and Gene are doing these cartoons. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. I never learned how to draw anatomy. I never learned how to draw a dog. Oh, no. Yeah, I was like, I don't need this. <laughs> and now I'm paying for it. I was doing... <laughs> <laughs> I was doing some uh, freelance, and uh, the person I was working with asked, like, uh, there's a shot coming up that uh, I'd like for you to board. Like, can you draw a dog? I was like, no. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just I'm just not going to. I just don't want to do that shot. I don't know how to draw a dog. I don't know. It's like, uh, here, I'm going to. Well, we got Scooby-Doo prompt. So, okay, hold on. Let's oh, go to the next I want to see your Scooby-Doo I'm gonna, after I'm you gonna... just said that you can't draw a dog. <laughs> I'm going to. Okay, so I'm going to try to draw Scooby-Doo without ever having drawn a dog let's see yeah. if i can get this right i was wondering also so kind of like how did you how was like also the process for you to put your portfolio together like ian like yes. after when you first kind of like like first of all at what point in high school did you realize you needed to put together a portfolio and second how was the process for you? Like, was it like emotionally and also in terms of like work hours? <laughs> yes. Oh my God. What a, this is taking me back because now I'm thinking too, like, oh, do, do kids still have to do this? Like, do people out of high school still have to do this for art schools? I don't even know. So hopefully this information's useful in any way, shape or form, but. That's all useful. Yeah. It was senior year of college, like right before, or excuse me, senior year of high school, right before we would leave and, and apply. I would say it was right before it ended, a good a good chunk before, but it was my senior year, I was really applying to colleges and really trying to get my portfolio together. And it was a lot of like what Gene was saying, where it's a lot of gestures, like you would do, yeah, still lifes, like set the plant up and then try and draw it or whatever. And that would depend, if I'm remembering correctly, I could be completely wrong, but I'm trying to remember correctly. It would de determine your scholarship, like where you were at... Mm in terms of your art level kind of depending on your scholarship. And I learned later after going to college that they were pretty lax on it. There were people who had, this is unrelated to the portfolio, but there were people who had grades that they weren't necessarily proud of that went there and they were like, yeah, dude, I have no clue how I'm here. So a lot of art colleges will just be like, yeah, everybody come. If you have the money, just come kind of situation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it does matter in terms of your your scholarships, like the the more promise or potential you show, because nothing in my portfolio was good. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I just illustrated that one I did of my little cartoon characters coming out of a TV. But mm -hmm. they, it was it was definitely like, now I think it's a little bit easier because now you can look at people's storyboard portfolios and see. I don't know how useful that is to get into college, but at least now you can see like baseline, like what people in the industry are doing and try and at least get close to that before, mm -hmm. you know, your high school career ends. But that's still a ton. Like you're going to college to learn, you know? So it's like... Don't be too upset if your portfolio isn't exactly where you want it to be. Or let's say it is. In that case, you're probably getting tons of scholarships. But it was all tough, but I got in and, and went through it. <laughs> <laughs> and how was um, the college experience for you? Like how, like, how long did you stay in college? And, like, what were, like, your favorite classes? Or, like, what was, what was the highlight of the experience for you? Oh, my gosh. This is a great question. Uh, I don't think anybody at this point needs to go to art college. I think it's one of those things where you, if you put in the work, you can learn. However, art college was pivotal for me. I needed it. There are so many people that I met that I'm now, you know, still friends with in the industry um, because they follow you. Like all those people that want to go into animation will go to animation, you know? That's what they pay yeah. to do, unless they don't. But most of the time <laughs> they do come. Unless they don't. <laughs> unless they don't. And they, in that case, great. But that's a lot of money they spent to not do it. But regardless... Yeah. It's one of the situations where the social aspect of it, the getting out of my of my hometown, like I didn't have to stay there any longer than the 12 years I was there or whatever uh, for school. And then um, getting out of there, like being by yourself, like being in a dorm. But the thing is, like, it's a ton of money to experience that. Uh, like, you know, I'm still in debt for it, but it was totally worth it for me personally. Um, and then all of everything they teach you, like the fundamentals you do kind of realize that maybe not everybody knows. Like, I feel like everybody has a little piece of art information that they absorbed from college that not everybody knows since art is just so subjective and everybody has their own different opinions on what is the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. Mm. Especially, like, if you go to CalArts, from what I hear, like, it's a lot of Disney people. So you might be learning a lot of, like, what Disney people do, but we don't know, like, where everybody's head's at in terms of art is in 2021, you know? So it's like... 
no matter what part people went to, everybody has like a different piece of the art pie that they can then use to make their art better. So, you know, wherever you find it's most comfortable for you to go to art college, I think there's there's benefits no matter what. But it's a, it's so much money. <laughs> it's so yeah. much money. <laughs> it's, it's oh, my God, it's an exorbitant amount of money. But it was worth it. It was totally worth it for me. I'm still paying it off, but it was totally worth it for me for the, the memories I made and and the, the classes I got to go to um, and just getting myself like mentally and physically, I think, prepared for it. Um, because then I was I was hired right out of college. That's what I was getting at. Yes. <laughs> um, how did college like play a part in you getting hired? And um, kind of, yeah, how was, how did you go from college to getting your first gig? Yes. Uh, I made a senior film <laughs> and it's called, <laughs> I, it's called Super Duper Team. Oh my God. I want to see that. I've never seen that. Have you never seen my senior film? No. I wonder if I remember the character. Hold on. I think I do remember the frog character a little bit. He had like a, he had a bandana. <laughs> Oh, there's your dog. <laughs> that's my, that my shit ass Scooby Doo. I don't. What does he look like? Ruby Rex. <laughs> Real me. Yeah. That's, that's my pathetic Scooby Doo. Anyway, yeah. So your character from your. Uh... Yes. So I, I have. You should watch my senior film. It's it, You'll watch it and you'll be like, oh, that's the most Ian shit I've ever seen in my life. Because I recognize that character. Maybe I have seen it. I don't know. Well, it's, it's been a long time. But I, I made this. And all my other friends' senior films were making it into the senior showcase. So the senior showcase is when everybody's parents come in for when you're um, graduating. Everybody's parents come and then they put all everyone, like the best animations on a theater screen for all the parents to watch. And mm -hmm. mine wasn't in there. And I was like, oh. damn it! <laughs> when you watch it, you'll understand. But regardless, <laughs> I was like, dang it! I want it in there. And, um, and so somebody dropped out. Somebody was like, I don't want my senior film shown. So they came to me and they were like, Hey, do you want your film in there? And I was like, yes, I do. So <laughs> mine did get to get, oh, that worked out to get shown. Yes. I was like, Oh, this is amazing. But regardless, right after, right after that, Amy, uh, at HUD Kips on Twitter, everybody go follow her. Yeah. Amy got hired immediately on big city greens for boarding right after she was. <laughs> so right after college, she got hired on, on, on that. And then, and I, also got a job offer from Big City Greens, but it took me forever to hear back from them. It was one of those situations where they're like, "What do we want to? Where do we want to put this kid?" And they put me in revisions. Is what they ended up doing. So I ended up getting a job right after because we were going to move to LA anyway. And when we traveled all the way to LA, I had my interview, uh, and then the rest is history. So it mm -hmm. was very fortunate with those situations of like I was pretty proud of the senior film I did enough to like squeak it into the the showcase, and then from there it was like okay, I have something that I can, like, show people of, like, okay, this is my range, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something else out of college that I really liked having was, like, this, like, accomplishment piece. Like, almost the senior film meant more to me than the certificate, the graduation, right. whatever you get at the end. I get that. But it's something you did, and it's, uh, yeah. The, the, the certificate, like, means nothing. I don't know where mine is. I think it's in a closet somewhere, and it's just, like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> What, am I going to frame it and put it up on my wall? Like, that's, I don't know. <laughs> Who gives a shit? Mine's on the side of my fridge. <laughs> okay, so you at least you at least have it displayed somewhere. Yeah, I've, <laughs> yeah, I like, Amy, I don't know where hers is, but mm -hmm. mine is at least there. But mine would be in a closet for sure. <laughs> it's, yeah. It means nothing. It was nice to have a finished product to show. That was, yeah. that was nice to have. Because that's why you're going to school. You want to create things. And so that's probably why it. It feels like, oh, this is the this is like the product of the last, you know, three, four years, whatever. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. You don't really get that sort of time after no, you start yeah. working anyway. So that's kind of like the moment that you are you can like make your your creation. <laughs> You're yeah. so right. It's it's sad, too, because like, you know, I won't get the time, the adequate time and resources that I had during college to do this kind of thing. And I don't even like watching it anymore. You know, it's like, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yeah it's old work now i know do you know if uh this is just a random question but do you know if like at your film showcase yes at school was it the recruiters or do you know if showrunners like slash artists are coming also to see these films that's yeah so what was happening was uh, do you guys remember would you guys 
when you guys were in college, would you watch all of the CalArts films when those were released? Not really. Um, I didn't. <laughs> that was like a big deal for us at SCAT. Like whenever mm. all the CalArts kids would drop their senior films, it was, or they would have films, I think every year, but whenever they would drop their films, everyone would, everyone in the animation and, uh, department would stop and watch them. Cause they were like, they were way better than anything we were churning out. So it was one of the things of like, ah, oh, dang it. And everybody, and that was the main way that CalArts kids would get their gigs was out of this too. So it was like, oh, if our animations are good, we'll get jobs. But that's not really how it worked. I ended up posting a bunch of comics on Tumblr. That's where I got my start was on Tumblr. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the showrunner for Big City saw it, uh, saw my comics. That's awesome. And then I think from there, saw my film to relate it. Oh, that's great. So how how often would you say, like, how active were you in social media while you were in school? Very. Oh, my gosh. Very. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all for, uh, for SCAD anyway, it was a cultural thing. Like, all of us were on social media trying to, like, make it. Yeah. Would you say that you were posting, like, on a daily basis or, like, weekly or? Yeah. Yeah. Daily. I would, I'll say weekly because I was still doing a lot of, like, still doing a lot of, like, school work and stuff like that. But I would always try. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to juggle both. Yes. Did you guys do that much? Like, did you? Were you guys on social media when you guys were in college? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I I wasn't so much on because I feel like for me, I might be no. I Gene and and I were kind of like, how old are you, Ian? Like, if that. I am twenty six. Four forty five. Oh shit. Yeah, (laughs) I'm five (laughs) hundred. Yeah, because I feel like I'm I'm just one year older than no we're the same we're the same year you and i Jean. but yeah. for me tumblr really picked up like after i graduated from Go tumblr Browse. was definitely after we got yeah that was yeah. like a later so thing. i didn't really have like i was i started on blogspot but blogspot was like it was so hard because you didn't like you couldn't like retweet or reblog so mm. you had to be friends with people because then they would put your name in the like in the side of their blog <gasps> it was that just was so a crazy big deal huh it was such a big deal because it was like if you weren't like cool then you weren't like linked in any other blogs and then you would just be like this underground like nobody right which what? was my case oh my for so God. long <laughs> that's insane and then i went on to tumblr <laughs> and on tumblr i was so happy wow it was a social game it yeah. was like it was like it was definitely like there was definitely like the click the like the like cool kids like clicks like if you drew because like it was okay like i'm gonna talk so much shit but it's okay let's do it let's freaking do it if you drew like Batman, Batman fan art, like you were cool. But if you drew anime, like you weren't. Cool. Oh my god! No, for real. And then like if you drew Hellboy, that was cool. But like, and if yeah, you drew, I know, right? And it's like, oh my god, uh, were you in comics? I wasn't doing so much, so much comics because like I was doubting myself a lot. So I was just like trying to. I I actually spent a lot of my college years just uh, really trying my foundation skills, like really right and. Yeah, but then and then I felt like liberated when Tumblr came around because I was like, well, I'll just do some fan art to practice. I did like because I I practiced like kind of copying like a little bit of like Adventure Time, Dragon Ball. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, uh, a lot of the Cartoon Network shows that you know were like the big rise of Cartoon Network, like regular shows, Steven Universe, and I posted those on Tumblr, and that kind of like helped my my social media presence. But um, yeah, before so that, Tumblr was yeah. big for you too then. Yeah. Was Tumblr big for Eugene? Uh, not really. I think that like, I I was on Twitter in college. I remember that it was kind of first really picking up steam, and that's when I started my Twitter. So that was probably, oh god, I don't know, eleven years ago. I know. Oh my god, I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, it's been forever. And um, uh, I was on DeviantArt for a long, long time. Oh god, yeah, I did forget I was on DeviantArt too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> DeviantArt. Well, you were doing cool shit. You were doing Hyperboy. Yeah. yeah, I was doing Hyperboy. Yeah, we talked about that a lot. Uh, Good. And uh, yeah, and uh, and then I did. Yeah, I did. I did start a Tumblr. I never quite got the hang of it. Uh, I think like I had a s- small following. But, um, I don't know. I don't think it ever cracked two thousand. And um, weirdly, Twitter has like been the one that has always been the most consistent for me. I think it like I just I don't produce enough art to really have those other ones work for me. I don't know about you, but it's it's hard unless you have a webcomic 
or or you can just like shit out illustrations like it's really hard to maintain yeah. content for tumblr for especially not for instagram because they just like it's like oh. a beast you got to feed it all the time and it's just Instagram's like, no, like I, impossible I, i've given up i'm yeah. like anyone who's popular on instagram you earned it <laughs> i'm like i don't care yeah you you made it yes i can't do it i'm kind of ch checking out and and pulling back from it because it's just like it sucks but um yeah yeah I as, think much, we... as much as go ahead go ahead oh i have nothing important to say you go ahead <laughs> <laughs> you're think... the guest ian no i like hearing because this is nice because i get to catch up with my friends too that's true it, it, it's it's tough too because like i feel like the pandemic hasn't made it easier in any way no. shape or form because it's one of those situations too where like i'm not posting about what i'm up to you know yeah. i'm not up to anything i'm not doing anything so it's like at least social media too even on instagram or whatever it's at least it's like hey i'm at i'm in cancun look how fun this is me and my family <laughs> Are you Ted Cruz? <laughs> oh, dang it. All right, this fine. Is, this is going to be dated by the time this... <laughs> this, this <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, you're right. Maybe I should... Um, actually, I said... What can I predict will happen in the future? I'm all vaccinated, and I'm actually hanging out with Gene and V in person. Wow, we Look at us go. Isn't this wonderful? Oh, I'm touching them right now. I'm giving them all hugs. Oh, you guys can't what see a nice it. hug. <laughs> I miss hugs. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do. It's one of those situations... Like, I love giving Amy hugs. They're wonderful. But, Joyous, even. But there is a but there. I do miss a friend, a good friend hug, because you don't hug a friend very often. When you hug a friend, something good happened. You know, there's something worthy of a hug. Mm -hmm. Nothing yes. more powerful than a friend hug. Yeah. I give them out like like Reese's Pieces. I don't know. I just, I'll take any kind of, uh, any kind of warmth I can get. Any kind of human affection. What a good life motto. <laughs> I just want to be warm. <laughs> Let me hug my friends. I just want to be warm. Yeah. <laughs> just give me a hug. <laughs> but yeah. Well, how how about your like work with Sonic stuff? Because that must have been like a crazy dream come true. Oh, my God. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. I was uh, unemployed in 2018. And I got the gig mainly because I think the overlap. There is a massive overlap in storyboarding and then also being a sonic fan there there are a lot of shows yeah. that make a lot of references to sonic that are like it's... oh like okay ko steven universe ben 10 craig yep. of the freaking creek with all their spin-off characters so it's like they're all there but i think the secret is nobody's very outspoken about it but yeah. i am i have the cojones to say you know what son the hedgehog is cool you do have the cojones <laughs> actually can you bleep that part out i don't want you said earlier I could like we could remove things. <laughs> don't put that in there. I don't want okay. the world to know. <laughs> okay. Just joking. Everybody can know that Sonic is cool. <laughs> but I don't think people were that vocal about being Sonic fans and storyboarding. So at least at the time. So like I feel like I was like the shoe in for it. And then I got in, I did my thing, and then I hopped out and I was like, oh my god, cool. <laughs> it was yeah. What was the job exactly like, by the way? Like uh, were you doing boards or? Yeah, I was doing boards. I'm trying to think of how much I can talk about. It. I'm sure it's most... been a while now. Yeah, it's been a long time. It's not relevant anymore. I can probably talk about it. I would. The thing was, my boss. <laughs> I don't want to name any names. My boss was overworked at the time, or at least working a lot. So it was one of those situations where I would board it, show him, and then he would give notes or just redo sequences. You know, so it's like mm -hmm. it's like a it's like a conjoined effort from the two of us. But it's always tough. I think the the, the bigger conversation, too, because I'd love to hear both of your inputs on this. I've become so jaded in the way of having to listen to <laughs> what corporate finds funny and then what you end up finding oh, funny. Man, and it's not yeah. necessarily a situation that like happened on the Sega, uh, Sega job. It's happened on many jobs. But it's like... I'm definitely getting bitter. <laughs> it's definitely one of those situations of like, when you see somebody talk about something that you worked on and they're like, oh, this could have been, this could have been better. And you're sitting there like, we tried, you know, mm -hmm. we, yeah. we tried to make it as good as possible. And I think that's like, I think the, the fight between artists and corporate is something I'd love to talk about if you guys were interested in talking about it. I that. love talking yeah. about it. I think that there's a lot to say and I'd love to know your perspective on it. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> I don't know if this is this is controversial or not. I think there needs to be non-artists involved in an artist's work because I think sometimes mm -hmm. artists can lose track of of everything that they need to do, or the scope just gets too big, you know, and then you got to pull mm -hmm. back, and that's never fun. Mm -hmm. I I do think they need to be there, but I would almost prefer if they were creatives at one point, 
you know, if yes. they had done the job before and then went into, you know, the executives just so they understand the, the, the pipeline and production and what needs to happen. Because I think mm -hmm. a lot of the times that's what happens is people don't understand the amount of time or effort or work that went into something to just have it completely upended, like you know, in different ways. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think I think that the relationship needs to exist, but I think it's getting more and more strained. And I don't know if the pandemic's helping it, but I would love to know what you guys think. We we've talked about it a little bit on the show before, and I I think it's I think it's incredibly like I think that uh, I wish more artists would be okay with making that jump over to the executive side because it yeah. it is it does you know you kind of give away the opportunity to do something of your own, but I think mm. that. I think that that kind of has that's such an impenetrable goal for most of us. Even the people who want it have a hard time breaking through that barrier. And so um, I feel like if there if there's any artist who works in animation and then decides like I think I want to like help on the other end of things, on the network side of things, you are holding like you are you are superhuman in that world because I yeah. think executives have a hard time wrapping their heads around a lot of creative stuff and creative problems and they understand the network side but they don't understand the the creative side the artist side yeah and so you become superhuman and a good example of that is phil rinda and like he who we have to get on the show someday but oh my he, god please yeah, get phil he, i would love to listen to that i think his perspective is really interesting and he can talk about it if we get him but like yeah i mean he was you know he worked on a bunch of amazing shows made a huge imprint and then just said like, fuck it. I don't want to do that anymore. And mm -hmm. his career skyrocketed, but as an executive. And so yes. it's like, you never know. It's like, you never know what thing is going to click. That's my take on it. V can, can say her take. It's kind of hard to say. Cause it's like, it really depends on the context. Like, I yeah. feel like corporate, like I feel like obviously corporate has like a lot more to say when you're working with like a really, really big IP. Oh my god, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, like on like for example, like working on a show like Loud House at Nickelodeon, there like I always thought Nickelodeon was very like nice. Oh yeah. Yeah. They... In terms of like corporate like feedback. It was like it was very like they were they were really friendly and there was like barely ever like any notes or the notes were like kinda minor and always kind of we're in the service of the show that's amazing that feels like you hit the hit the lottery i feel like honestly it was like it was like a really pleasant experience uh working on as a storyboard artist because also you would pitch in front of the execs and they were always like yeah really you know like positive and, and happy and they would laugh which was like it's like it's so great you know like you're you, oh. it, it's it feels really nice to have like people so open oh my god i'm like envisioning envisioning executives laughing at my jokes and i'm like oh what a perfect <laughs> freaking world i know yeah and then you have like shows like uh like on when i was on spidey it's like it's not so much that they don't want to do that it's just like the brand is so big it's just so big and there's so much going on with this brand that like sometimes you want to pitch an idea and they might be like, oh, we love this. But like there's art like this idea is already happening and like like this completely other part of the brand, mm. you know. Oh, that's true. I guess you don't know everything that's going on, too. Yeah. So I guess your worldview is kind of small in that regard. Yeah, it's like, you know, because you think like, oh, well, I'm, I'm like working on this movie and we can do everything we want to do. But then it's like you can't because you have like all these like uh different like moving parts so like in yeah. that regard i could say yeah it's and you know so i guess like context is key and also it depends on like the studio like working this was like i'm i promise i'm not gonna like talk too long but uh, <laughs> um i'm i'm enthralled so i'm good once heard on a <laughs> on like like pitching you know pitching 101 like they're like mm -hmm. yeah you have to do your research on the network you're pitching to and, uh, and like, cause like, depending on the network, like they do, they're not like waiting, like they're waiting for you to pitch an IP or like in, in the style of their brand. And I'm like, like, I don't know what their brand is. And it's like, like you, and it's kind of hard because it's like, you can watch all the shows that they're producing, but then like, you're kind of like late on their brand, on the network's brand. Mm. Like if you're watching, like, for example, the show that's coming out today, that's a show that's been made like 
probably like two years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. Three years. Yeah. Two, three years ago. Yeah. So you kind of have to be like in the industry, like in the know and like, and then you're like, Oh, this network is like looking for quirky shows now. Now their brand is like quirky or like, <laughs> or like, Oh, now they're like looking for this, like really wholesome and sweet. So now that's their new brand. And it's like, kind of like, yeah, let's, Even so the- it's always kind of changing and also like, but there, but there's also like a through line, right? Like, for example, mm-hmm. I don't know, like Nickelodeon's always going to be kind of like, like fun and like, uh, lots of energy right i don't know i feel like that's yeah. kind of how i see it yeah but stuff stuff slips through the cracks even there it, it's like yeah it, i always i'm glad you brought that up because that that advice always irked me for some reason and i think you help me understand why because like yeah people say like research the network and i feel like if you need to be told that you shouldn't be pitching because you should already know what right. each network how do you not know the difference between cartoon network and nickelodeon if you're mm-hmm. if you don't know the difference why are you like trying to pick pitch an animated show and so oh, exactly. yeah. and beyond that you're absolutely right because it's like yeah you're gonna be behind no matter what and so i always yeah. tell people like just pitch what you want to pitch because you don't know what what conversation they might have had that day that is suddenly you know their boss told them like we need a show with superhero dogs and then you pitch a superhero dog show and they're like oh that's exactly what we like my boss told me to, to find and yeah. so it's like and 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 they might not have that kind of show that's a bad example because i guess they would probably be told more broad things usually it's like we want this kind of character I, I i like where your head's at though because it is one of those situations of every time you like adventure time is the perfect example because at the time before yeah. adventure time came out weren't they doing all the live action shit at Cartoon yeah, Network? yeah yeah so yeah, it's yeah. like if if they were if if you were there watching all this live action stuff and you're like ooh, Cartoon Network does live action now I'll pitch a live action show you're already behind <laughs> Adventure mm-hmm. Time ended up like creating this new wave of everything else that came after it so it's like you would have missed your chance so just do your passion project just I do your passion good, projects that's a good advice yeah. I like that hey yeah. we got a little yeah. girl in there forty five <laughs> minutes in and even that's hard to do but at least you won't. It's easier to accept the failure when it's something that you pour, poured your... It's like what you believed in and you wanted to uh, make. But if yes. it's something you're, you're pandering to, you're doubly disappointed. And, oh my and God, like, yeah. You, you didn't even call the right shot, you know? And so that's not fun. You don't want to do that. No, I agree. But yeah. I was going to go back to your career really fast. Of course. Uh, and so you started as a revisionist on Big yes. City Greens. How long did you do this for? And um, kind of like, what was your step after that? Your next step after? Yeah. I was a revisionist for two years, I think. Or maybe just one year. But um, I was a revisionist for a while. And then I was like, I want to do boarding. And and I was always trying to do boarding on the show. I was always like, I want to board. I want to board. I want to board. So I knew my time was short on the show because I wanted to leave and do boarding um, regardless. So what I ended up doing was leaving the show and, and really hype, like heightening up my board portfolio. And I learned so much being a revisionist. I'll talk about what being a revisionist is real quick. Nobody ever yeah. seems to know unless somebody already has talked about it on the show. No, but go ahead. Yeah. Please talk about it, please. Being a revisionist is... It's a beautiful job where you get to see everyone else make mistakes. It's like <laughs> you it's like you get everybody's boards and everybody boards a different way and you need it to look one way because where we're at in the animation industry is nobody trusts the overseas studios when they're animating. Even if they're That's really good. Crazy. Nobody trusts yeah. them. So yeah. it's like, okay, so you have to so the board artists don't have time to overboard and they shouldn't overboard. So the revisionists can sometimes go in and polish up or add more uh, poses to certain things to make sure it reads perfectly as intended. Um, so when overseas studios uh, animate it, um, it's there won't be too much back and forth because that back and forth, right, of like, hey, reanimate this costs the company money. Right. So they try and keep that as short as possible or as as minimized as possible. So the revisionists try and tackle it as much uh, as much as they can. Um, and it's one of those situations where you you watch all the board artists make mistakes and as a revisionist you're fixing them so then when it comes time of like oh i'm promoted to storyboard artist you kind of know what to avoid like sure you might fall into those pitfalls but at the same time you've seen everybody already make those kinds of mistakes so situations of like ooh, let's try and reuse this background how about we restage the shot so then 
as you're boarding, you're more conscious of like, oh, let's reuse some shots more often. And there's situations too where it's like, oh, we have to we have to put incidentals in. So if you have, if the storyboard artist has free time, they don't. This is a weird piece of advice, but regardless, maybe I'll go ahead and put the incidental in there for them. You know, it's it's things like that that you kind of like pick up on as you move along. Yeah, I don't do anything that's not... <laughs> I oh, don't yeah. do anything that's not asked of me directly. It's like... Oh, no, and you shouldn't. Yeah, storyboard yeah, artists yeah, yeah. are just, the most overworked <laughs> position. But it is like... It's just nice knowing more about the pipeline beforehand. I remember when I was working there, working as revisionist on Big City, one of the board artists walked up to me and was like, um, so what does a revisionist even do? I've never even mm -hmm. done it. And I was like, oh, like as somebody who wanted to be a board artist, it was like, no, <laughs> don't ask me this. You don't even know what my job does. Darn it. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. I think it's a super important position. I think it's a little weird that it's an entry level position, seeing how it's the last this is the last like person to touch it before it goes to animation you know so mm -hmm. you have to be confident in your posing and you have to be confident in your back and in the ability to do backgrounds because board artists hate doing backgrounds and they won't so like you have to do them so it's it's a lot of work i think i think there's a lot of downtime yeah. too as a revisionist there's a lot of time where you're like waiting for stuff to come in but when it, it is in it's a lot of like technical work that i think is a perfect entry level position because you see how the entire you interact with everybody when you're yeah. a revisionist. It's a more technical job for sure. Yeah, and that's my that's my revisionist spiel. I think I think I covered it. You covered it. It's different for every show. Yeah, like on Jellystone, I was revisions and I did mostly conforms. Like I mostly just was uh, preparing the files for delivery to the studio, and it was it was writing out action notes. A lot of writing out action notes, double checking yeah. the dialogue. I didn't mind it. It worked for me because I was doing a lot of other creative things at the time. And so I, I didn't, yeah. I was, you know, it worked for me. And, and so like, uh, it depends on what you're going, going into the job with, like what expectations you're going into it with. It really depends on the show. It depends on the show. Yeah. I feel like depending on the show, because it depends on like the showrunner style and like how they envision revisions to be. I think it's one of the biggest things that I learned moving to the U.S. is that, like, shows are run so differently from a show to another here. Mm, oh, yeah. Each crew yeah. or not. Each production is different. Yeah. Like, in, in France, like, they're, like, because, like, there's no time, like, people are just kind of like, well, this is the pipeline. This is how it always is. And there's not so much, like, second guessing as into, like, what position is what, because everybody does always the same thing. But right. here it's like... Like you really do, every time you come onto a new show, you really do have to figure out what your role really is and like when it starts and when it stops. Cause yeah. it can be very different from a production to another. Yeah, revisions. And I think there's a kind of a problem with the breakdown of what the jobs are at this point, because like, it's like Ian was saying- They're bleeding into one another. Exactly, it's like you were saying, it's like revisions maybe is not as much work as boards but that's because boards does so goddamn much and so yeah. it's like revisions should be on any pipeline should only be making corrections once the board has been finished yes so you're essentially the you know the board artist should in theory just lay down the story beats and and be done with it like it's mm -hmm. you know maybe even not cleaned up and then the revisionists can go in and clean up anything that's not clear they can kind of do that that work but with a lot of shows that i you know friends that i've seen working on stuff where it's like the board artist does everything from you know yes. clean, from from thumbs to roughs to clean to even revisions sometimes they end up having to do yeah. some notes mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah you work revisions can work closely with the directors yes revisions usually works more closely with the directors and it's yeah it's just odd i feel like there's you could break that pipeline up a little bit where board artists wouldn't have to do the cleanup for their own boards because you're you end up redrawing the same stuff three times and it's like it's exhausting i know you don't get as much ownership of the final drawings that's the only thing yeah which is tough in an art driven job yeah but do you i was just gonna say do you really anyway because it ends up getting animated and changed and you know so it's like yeah you can't get too attached you're right so you did a uh, big city greens and then you landed the storyboard gig after that well what, what yes. was it was it the sonic gig yeah so when i was 
yeah, how did my timeline go? So I was at Big City. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a board for them. And then after that board, I left. And after that, I got the Sega gig, which was super fun. And then after mm -hmm. that, I got DreamWorks. And then I was on The Mighty Ones, which is now out on Hulu. Go watch it. Go watch it. Go watch it. And then, yeah. So then I was on The Mighty Ones. And then after that, I was on, I, I went immediately to Jellystone. Yeah. And uh, what were all the shows that you worked on board driven? Or did you have also some script driven shows? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That's actually a great point. Yes. They, they were all board driven, um, which I'm not opposed to doing script, but it is very freeing. Um, one of my bosses told me that he felt more like a cog in the machine with a script driven show mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of one of those things of like, I keep saying that. Oh, do you guys notice how many times you say certain phrases doing this over and over? I've given up on I, I just... That's amazing. <laughs> it's like stream of consciousness for me. I don't think too hard about it. Anymore. That's true. Oh my, I just, I just became cognizant, I guess, of what I'm saying, which yeah, is it ha it a happens. fun moment. It'll, it'll pass. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you guys are so experienced. Yeah, we're <laughs> grizzled. I, um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not I, I'm not opposed to doing script. I think script at this point in my career would be very nice to just kind of take a break. Mm. But you do kind of feel like a cog in the machine in the way of there you're really just being used for your storyboarding skills, not necessarily what you have to offer writing wise. Not saying that you can't help put in work for a script, but a lot of the shows that I've been paying attention to that are script are like stick to the scripts. Mm. Where there are some that are like, hey, you can throw your thing in there too. But I think I think it uh, depends on the production. Whereas board driven all the time, it's, oh, these were my choices with my jokes, with my way of doing the characters. You know, there's some kind of ownership. It's interesting having ownership of something that you don't really have ownership of, if huh. that makes any sense. Yep. In my mm -hmm. experience, yeah. V, yeah. Do, v, have you mostly been on script driven stuff or have you been on board driven stuff? Uh, most mostly script driven, honestly. I I really enjoy script driven shows, uh, yeah. mostly because I think it's a lot harder to do a board driven show uh, to to land a gig in a board driven show because you're not only auditioning your drawing skills, but you're also auditioning like your writing style, and it's kind of more like casting, like an actor, you know, like yeah, oh like do you do you really get the show? Like, will you be our friend? Kind of thing, which is like a lot more like hurts your ego a lot more if you're not yes what a way to put that oh my god i agree uh, wow a casting call that's why it's so cutthroat too this yeah. yeah definitely because it's like even if you can draw the characters perfectly on model like if you don't have like the right sense of humor which is like you know like there's there's nothing you can do about it like maybe you think i don't know fart jokes are funny and the show is like <laughs> no fart jokes yeah it's, <laughs> you know v and her fart jokes you're always squeezing those in mm -hmm. <laughs> Squeezing them out. Ooh! Whoa. <laughs> Venus bam. and Genus. Bam, bam, bam. Anyway. Yeah, tell us about uh, what kind of stuff really got you into drawing and um, made you want to pursue animation as a career. Influences. Yeah. Um, drawing is so secondary to me just wanting to tell jokes. You know? It's like, I don't want to write. Interesting, yeah. Because I also like drawing. And mm -hmm. I think realizing that, realizing that I draw to try and be funny was such a big moment for me because it because in, at least in college you would see like your friends be interested in learning anatomy or learning backgrounds or learning color or like really trying to make their art look as pretty as possible and I didn't really care like I was like yeah I want my art to look good but like once I'm at this once I'm at a certain level I'm like I'm good as long as I can get what's across in my head out I'm fine and, and yeah. my level is not that that massive so it was mostly like a lot of like, I have art inspirations of, like, oh, I want to draw like that. But if somebody's funny, I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I just stare at their work. Like, how is this so effortlessly funny? That's great. That Yeah. Random question. Have you ever, like, thought about being a comedian? Uh, I did improv. I took an improv class in college. What, really? Oh, <laughs> great. I, I told my mom. I was like, Mom, I took an improv class. And she was like, you? And I was like, oh. Oh, <laughs> Mom. <laughs> I was like, I could, yeah. You know, she roasted me. The She's mom funnier roast. than I was. I took the improv class. That's really funny. Yeah. Do you feel like your parents are funny? <laughs> That's a. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are so much funnier than me. Uh, my parents aren't that like they don't draw or anything. Right. 
they're not like i don't know where i got my creativity from but like nobody else in my family draws but everybody's funny Mm -hmm. like they'll get their one-liners in okay because yeah i I, something i've kind of um come to realize is that like people that are a certain way are usually because that's how their families are and i i like i don't think about people's families much because it's just like you don't want to assume things yeah but but then you'll meet somebody's mom or dad or even siblings and you're like oh that's why you are this yeah. way like yeah it's like a clean line from like from their sense of humor to their like wacky dad that makes puns you're like you are <laughs> your dad i got it you know it's interesting that's totally true that's 100 percent true yeah i um it's always fun being on the outside in like when you do meet somebody's family or like they do tell you a story about the family and you're like oh i get it now it's like the mm-hmm. one more puzzle piece you needed to understanding this person exactly it's like yes. it's from yeah, the yeah, family yeah. yeah no i 100 percent relate to this i've had that kind of moment before <laughs> yeah it's always really interesting was there like a specific moment for you that like uh in media i, I would say like a specific yeah. moment for you that really made you be like i want to pursue animation or i want to pursue comics because you did say you wanted to do that at at one point yeah a big insertion calvin and Hobbes is so sure timelessly good that's like the easy one to be like that but i also read a lot of manga like my parents were always like hey uh you gotta start reading and i was like okay but i would (laughs) i'll read comic books yeah i'm like i want to read comics you fuckers yeah i would always choose uh manga to read i'd always be like oh i want to read this and so just seeing the art form of comics just at its peak is just so absolutely freeing and inspiring because I was never interested in superhero comics uh, in the way of like what Marvel and DC were doing. Mm -hmm. I guess the more American stuff at the time anyway, like at least when I was growing up, a lot of manga started really blowing up like Tokyo pop started like publishing Mm -hmm. and Shonen Jump was, you could actually get that in the mail back in the day. I used to get that. Oh, I dude, I got it. Shonen Jump for like, five years or something like i have awesome. a huge stack of shonen jumps back home i miss it i'm like i wouldn't mind getting that in the mail again what do i care yeah yeah i mean it was really nice and it was it, the problem is, is that they started curating it too heavily and it was like it was like a way to drive sales for shittier manga instead of the ones you cared about oh my god you're so right that's when i unsubscribed the app is nice that two dollars app is app, amazing that oh my oh. god v do you use that yeah, I actually just uh, subscribe over quarantine to viz.com. Oh, because you're like, smart. Because <laughs> you're a smart person. I'm like, I was just like, oh, it's it's like, it's cheaper than a coffee cup. Like, it's I so just, cheap. You know, it is. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They're just handing it away. They're like, oh, you want your you want your manga, you little weeb? Here you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't even read it for like months at a time, but I'm like, dude, I've pirated so much manga. Like, just take it. <laughs> just just take my money. Like, it's, all, it's fine. You can take the two, three dollars, whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. <laughs> I do wish that they would, because um, they have a, a lot of their, like, cr- they have current stuff, and they have some classics, like, legacy stuff, and I've read a lot of that, but there's stuff that Shui Sha owns that they won't put on there, like, I Shield 21 is not in there, and I'm like, what? 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 It's on the app? It's not on the app, even though they mm-hmm. own it, and I'm like, well, that's weird, and so they're, and the, like, Hunter x Hunter, like, they don't put Hunter x Hunter on the app and those are popular ones it's probably like a rights kind of thing yeah i know like um, shaman king is not on this shaman, shaman king is. isn't owned by shui Sha anymore so i i get yeah. that but mm-hmm. hunter x hunter is still owned by them and they they <gasps> add they have the volumes on there. you can buy them in volumes uh digitally but you can't just like read it and i'm like well what it's just odd. they know they know hunter x hunter fans will pay for it they might be right but it's a bummer because I, you know, I kind of run out of stuff to read. I was wondering if it wasn't like the rights from um, Japan to the U.S. Because sometimes like maybe like they sold the rights to, I don't know. Yeah, it's legal, probably something. Legal battles. It's something. But yeah, Shonen Jump is great for sure. Yeah, so those are some of my inspirations. It was definitely whoever was funny I would cling to. Azumanga Daya was funny. Oh, <laughs> I remember okay. reading that back in the day. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was a big weeb. So a lot of that kind of in that vein. Like those four mm-hmm. panel comics, I would always read. Mm-hmm. So you've always been kind of like more invested in like, like kind of more like, yeah, kind of more like Sunday funnies rather than like the big like soap opera or like uh, epic like type manga. Yes. Well, it was, it's always interesting too, because I don't think I've ever asked people, um, did you guys read the Sunday comics every Sunday? Like, would you read them? 
I did read them actually when I first moved to the US because like we were getting the newspaper and I was just like I didn't know any of those comics except Garfield because Garfield is so big in Europe. Iconic, but, yeah. Yeah. And the I don't know, Garfield's like art style is also so appealing. Oh yeah. He <laughs> Garfield's such a weird mishmash of shapes. Every time like I look yeah. at Garfield, I'm like, wait, what is this? <laughs> Garfield is an odd, odd character design. I did read that. Yeah, for a, for a minute we were getting the newspaper, and I would read the Sunday comics. But yeah, I had Calvin. And Ho- I, I like. I would buy those Calvin and Hobbes collections. That like yes, because you're smart. The, yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, it was like I'm a gene. <laughs> yes, duh. We can't forget. But it, yeah, I had like three of those, and then literally like uh, last year I bought that hardcover collection finally, and I'm oh I'm good. At it. Isn't that thing beautiful? It's really nice. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now on the shelf. I haven't I haven't even opened it, but. Uh, like I haven't cracked open the books, but I'm just happy to own it. <laughs> like I just, yeah. I, I just, I love Calvin and Hobbes. It means, it means a lot to me too. Yeah. No, it's, it's crazy that people now like might not even know about Calvin and Hobbes just because like a Bill Waters are not doing anything with it, which is fair and fine. But it's like, I want more people to read it, you know, so it becomes yeah. relevant. But did you, regardless. did you read any web comics uh, growing up or like just yes. kind of over the, over the years? My favorite web comic of all time is nedroid.com have you ever been there oh fuck yeah 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 anthony dude clark, yeah. oh anthony clark is so funny he's, he's such hysterical a funny v have you ever heard of these bear tato comics i don't think oh I wow have. oh really funny. you have a great evening ahead of you yeah you do reading this these beautiful wonderful comics have you read back Back. No, I have not read Back. So Back is him doing the art and Casey Green writing it. And um, it's it's a linear story. It's wrapping up as as of this recording. I think it's <gasps> it might, might even be over. I got to catch up. But uh, it's great because there's like a really compelling narrative, but it's like silly. And it's got it's got Anthony Clark's like visual sense of humor, but Casey Green's yes. like wit. And it's it, not enough. People are sleeping on it. And it's so funny. I don't understand why. That's it's not so funny. sad. Anything he touches, I'm like, yes. So the fact that I haven't read it yet, I'm kind of like, oh, man. Go for it. it. Yeah, dive in. It's great. Now I have something to do tonight. This is Yay! already wonderful. This is yeah. already worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it was not It was not worth it up until now. You were. No, ready. 100% not. No, I was yeah. like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah, I'm going to do an interview with these two weebs. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Talking about Dragon Ball every episode. <laughs> Talk about um, fucking Dragon Ball. <laughs> uh, yeah, what other web comics? Um, have you ever heard of what are the ones I used to? Because now, now I don't really like. Where where are all the uh, web comics now? Webtoon. Webtoon. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. V is comic. Uh, Rodney, check I out guess. Rodney R. Rodney on Webtoon <gasps> and Instagram. Oh, of course. And... Oh, please excuse me. You're right. I need to. I'm plugging. I'm plugging your comic. I need to plug all my friends. Yeah, Rodney, hundred <laughs> percent. Go read that on Web Webtoon. Um, go read Merkworks. Oh yeah, Dave's so funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm on Webtoon right now. I'm never on this website. Wait, should I be on it's Webtoon? It's a weird ecosystem. I've thought about yeah? jumping on there too because it. Yeah, what's nice about that is that if you just start to do well, they'll like back you financially and. Um, yeah. Oh, is that where you're at, V? Can you talk about this? Is that cool to talk about? Uh, sure. I mean, I started. Well, the thing for me was just like. I've tried uploading comics to Webtoon before Rodney. They didn't perform super well because the thing with Webtoon is that you have to serialize your comic and you have to Mm. always kind of like remember people. Wow. So it's like a time investment. It is. Yeah, I I really like, I mean, people don't really enjoy the Twitter threads because Twitter threads get broken after like probably like 30 or like 50 posts. Mm -hmm. They're tough. Yeah, um, but I like them. I like Twitter threads mostly because when someone sees your latest strip that gets reblogged or whatever, like they easily go into your thread. Like Twitter threads really pay off when they become really big and people are invested yes. and then they reblog the thread and then people like the whole thing. Oh, you're right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's kind of how I started reading the like Mr. Boop. <laughs> Oh, is that I the mean, Betty Boop one? It's so funny. <laughs> it's so, so funny. It's, funny. He's kind of like the person that inspired me to do threads. Oh, really? Cause I, yeah, because, I mean, I don't know him personally. I mean, now, okay, I'm so sorry. Like, I know this is your episode, Ian, but like. No, this is wonderful. I'm having so much fun. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm a happy camper. We're just talking about nothing. It's great. He's so, he's so funny. I don't know him personally, but yeah, like, yeah, I was just like really inspired by, by that, like, mm-hmm. comic. And I just That's realized, a- you know, like, you get like 
the interaction right away. And mm -hmm. like the good thing about Twitter threads is that your comic can go really viral because let's pretend you have someone with a lot of followers that can just reblog it. And then a lot of people will like, get drawn to it. Whereas on Webtoon, it's all on you. Like there, like there's no reblogging happening. So you really have what? to just keep reminding really? people. So Webtoon won't sink any time into it until you're popular. But until then, yeah. it's up to you to become popular? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What? What? I know. What kind of website worth its salt does that? But it's like, that's that's when you do the canvas thing, which is like the free. So you, you like, you could, they're, they're basically hosting your comic for free. And I really like the platform. I think it's pretty good. It's a very slick platform. 100%. Yeah. This is, I, I'm never on it. I'm I'm scrolling down right now and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is I, well made. So I guess that's where you're you're going is like just like yeah. a polished website that already has good content. I guess that's the draw then. Yeah. And it's also like, I feel like Webtoon just makes it really easy for people to read your comics. It's mm. just uh, because, and also the biggest difference is that people who go on Webtoon go on Webtoon to read comics. Twitter, people go on Twitter for I don't know what random reason. Yeah, I have no clue why. You're right. <laughs> At this point, I don't know anymore. Yeah. That's great. Oh, my gosh. I love talking about comics. So we could talk about this all day. I'm, <laughs> that is that is such a great point. I think it's I, – I do like Instagram for comics because you can't see the whole comic initially. You know, people have started, like, yeah. displaying yes. the panels. And at least for gag comics, there's something yeah. to be gained from that. Whereas, like, yes. you can't just look at the last panel and spoil it for you. It's like, you need to go through it and you read get, it yeah. and yes. absorb it to get it, you know? It's built-in pacing, yeah. yeah. Yes, and that I do like about it. But you're right, Twitter is awful for comics. Twitter is not a great place for comics. I, I see comics people all the time experiment with how to do it. Like, oh, we'll put one pan we'll upload one panel at a time in one tweet. But I, <laughs> it's the same thing with music, I think, not to compare the two, but I think music is also really hard on Twitter because it's hard to get people to yeah. just stop and listen to something yeah, in the same absolutely. way it's hard to get people to stop and read tiny text that they have to scroll into on a comic you know mm. it, it is tough yeah that's so true i feel like it's kind of and once again i think that's the reason why i think threads but that's my personal opinion right like i think threads are well here's the thing i feel like when you upload a comic on twitter uh you do have to pace it in a way i'm so sorry about the ambulances should i just kind of like stop and like that's downtown living baby downtown um, la baby <laughs> but like i feel like twitter and instagram are similar when you want to upload comics in regards to every time you upload you need it to be more comedy driven because a comedy driven comic will perform so much better than mm -hmm. a drama or like a comic that is that has hooks so in my opinion i think like on twitter i i started slowly kind of getting rodney more into a formula of like a setup like a joke and a hook but yes. all of this has to happen in one strip yeah that's a lot of work that's a ton of work you know yeah it's, it's yeah it's really hard <laughs> it's super hard and it's like and it, you're not only drawing you're also writing it, like mm -hmm. you're saying it's 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 a it's a lot of work for the payoff that becomes like you said a longer thread will always do better like if you go through and look at the betty boop thread he loses engagement you know, like you see the, the, the comic, like the comics are consistently funny, but you yeah. see the engagement drop on certain com like you see them explode certain comics, some of them don't. That's just a, that's just the, the nature of a long thread. But that thread is so successful because he finished it. He committed, you know? He committed yeah. and also the thing is that like your original post is going to get a lot of likes. So 100%. no matter what you do, your original post is the one that's going to get retweeted because people retweet the thread. And I think, but I could be wrong, the algorithm kind of favors tweets that already have like a lot of likes and or retweets. So yeah. when you go viral, it's easier, like it's easier for your whole thread, your, like your original thread to kind of blow up than your individual page, I yeah. think, but I could be wrong. I, but that's the, that's the thing too is that there's no data for this like everybody's just guessing because that yeah. sounds like to me but it's like nobody knows but even then it's like let's say you do do <laughs> dude, you're already okay. doing a complete thread but the payoff won't be until the end of that thread and then people feel completely comfortable sharing that entire thread you know like now now that the the betty boop thread is done you can now just go to that thread and read the whole thing Right. Like it's all there, but like, how much engagement did he lose not uploading those one by one and losing that entire thread? 
I guess is the question because Twitter's just not great for it. And threads yeah. aren't great. <laughs> threads are broken. Yeah, there's no real answer. I, I tried because I've been re-uploading my Planet Panic pages and like yeah. I I tried doing it as a thread and it was good for the first few and then um I was getting abysmal numbers and I was uploading three times a week with like fully animated pages. Dude, those are insane. Well, I was yeah, doing them once crazy. a week. I was doing them once a week when I was doing them. And so it was, you know, that's the actual timeline. And that was with a full-time job. Wow. Oh my God. You pow- Both of you are powerhouses. I'm not tooting my own horn. That's, it was a lot of fucking work and, and I don't recommend oh, any yeah. of that. But... No, I mean, it's so apparent looking at it how much work that took. Yeah. So I wanted to re-upload them because I think a lot of people hadn't seen them. People that have seen the short hadn't seen the comic. And so I was like, yeah, let's see um, what this can do just to raise awareness for it again. And like, and so... Yeah, I started to lose numbers, and then I I switched to doing just single page uh, tweets, and also funny enough, I just would ask like, "Hey guys, give me some likes and and replies to like help fight the algorithm." And people are nice, and they did, and it really helped. And I'm yeah. like, God, like I think a lot of people with when it's something serialized, it just becomes background noise, and you start immediately like within two three installments people stop paying attention and it's just like oh yeah another update and 100 they don't engage yeah that's exactly why it's really hard to write for the um, social media because you need to constantly have like every single page needs to have this like joke like that like yeah. meme ability yeah. and the hook which oh, is yeah. a lot which is a lot <laughs> it's it's too much it's interesting comparing the comics that are on instagram and the comics yeah. that are on twitter because mm-hmm. like there is overlap like there are people who are both popular on twitter and instagram and they're called gods <laughs> um but the people who are popular on instagram there's a lot of uh, the the humor se- seems to be a lot of relatability like uh, there there was a time on twitter where relatable comics were like the thing but that's not necessarily anymore mm. but it does seem like the ones on twitter are the ones that not only have that meme potential, but they're also colored and polished and yeah. in the way of like time was spent on this time that I don't necessarily have, you know, yeah. <laughs> it, it gets tough. It's, it's interesting just because none of us are necessarily getting paid for a lot of this work. So it is like, it's just our own branding that yeah. feels bizarre. It's like, I don't want to be a brand anymore. Like, I just want to be a person like uploading what I like. Like, I don't like expectations. Like I just want to do whatever I, I kind of feel like doing. Um, and I feel like that gets lost the longer too that we're stuck on social media. Not helping is the pandemic because all I am is on yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Oh man. No, and I really relate to it because I feel like for me, Twitter. I at first when I started using Twitter, I was like, "This is great. This can be like my scrapbook, and I just can post just whatever the heck I want." And then. I, as I started getting followers, I was like, well, now there's expectations. Gosh, dang it. Oh, 100%. That's what happens. That's exactly <laughs> what happens. You got to keep that like youthful energy. You know what I saw recently? I would love to hear guys' takes on this because I went off when I heard this take. There was this comic I was reading and there was one panel of this comic and it said, memes killed the comic industry. Okay. Mm-hmm. I would... Love to hear initial thoughts on that. Um, For me, well, and this is strictly from my experience and from my experience reading comics online, but um, there's like, there's different kinds of comics, right? You have yes. comics that are character based so that they're closer to a TV show in that regard. And then you have comics that are more like satirical comics that are kind of more like, you know, like your, your political comics, right? Right. I do feel like there is a strong competition between these type of like kind of like the New Yorker kind of comics or like the or like these like political cartoons and memes because they are the same formula, which is one picture or like one square and a little bit of text, which is definitely what a meme is. It's like big picture, little bit of text. And that combination is like exactly, yeah, like the New Yorker. So there is competition there. However, a comic that is like Garfield, for example. So like, what I could relate that to is like there's like a web comic called uh, Pixie and Brutus. It's on Webtoon and Instagram. It's like this little cat, kitten, and this like dog who was like a military dog. And 
like what's funny is their interaction a military dog yeah military like it, it's like a retired military dog it's really cute because it's like he's like he's like all jaded and like just like it's oh my like, god it's like that trope right where it's like the old like jaded like <laughs> i life see is gritty and like the little kitten is like cute and like wowzy and like super gullible and naive and cute the comic is <laughs> you know it's like uh look it up i think it's really cute i will what's it called again pixie and brutus oh cute i like the name and yeah. it's like i mean you know like uh i i bring it up mostly because of this a meme cannot beat this because they're because this is character based this is like right. calvin and hobbes and the main reason why I think comics can survive against memes is that if you have a character and like, I'm kind of tooting my own horn here, but like Rodney does like, like well enough because it's character based. So exactly. People are like tuning in to him. They're not tuning in for just the joke. Like the joke is also here to help. That's the hardest thing to achieve too, is to get people to come for the characters. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. It's really, it's really hard, but at the same time, that's what a TV show is. It's like, why do you like watch SpongeBob? Exactly. Because he's like quirky and fun, and like you want to be his friend. And it's kind of funny because that's kind of what the comments I'm getting for Rodney is like, I want to be his friend. I want to hang out with him. I want to sit like next to him or whatever. <laughs> oh, what a good thing to get! Oh my god, that's exactly what you want. Even though like Rodney's <laughs> such a creepy character, <laughs> it's exactly what you want. Yeah, that's a straight. It's. It's an odd take, but I mean... Hey, there's an audience for it. <laughs> yeah, there's an audience for it. Yeah, whatever works. I literally did not think this would happen. I was just like, haha, this is funny. He's creepy, haha. And now, I don't He's know. got that, like, that Tumblr appeal. I don't know how else to explain <laughs> it. It's like, any, any, like... Any like skinny, pale, uh, greasy, black haired character <laughs> that has like social awkwardness. You mean the one slur? I was exactly thinking of the one slur. But it's like. I mean, he. I didn't even know about the one slur before. It. You tapped into an ecosystem. Oh! I'm like, oh my god. V. Rodney might be uh, the one slur 2.0. Yeah, he might be. I, I did. I mean. I hope like none of my Rodney fans will send you this because they will be so upset. But he kind of does look like the one slur. Listen, oh my I'm god, sorry. he kind of looks like the one slur. <laughs> it's kind of true. I think it's just people project themselves onto it a little bit, and, and you know they they if if they feel like they're socially awkward and like oh. they'll see that character and be like, wow, it's me or whatever, you know. And so to some That's degree, true, yeah. And so, which is what you hope for. I wish I could be him. That de definitely is how I was like, kind of like writing him. I was like, oh, I wish I could be him, that I could mm -hmm. do the things that he does. That's what's fun about having your own characters too. But please. Ian, let's talk about your characters. We haven't yeah. even brought up Grubby the Grape yet. Exactly. Grubby the Grape. Tell me about Grubby the Grape. Why just start Grubby the Grape? He came about because one of my bosses was gently, gently telling me that I wasn't funny enough to do boards. Oof. And I was like, holy shit. And he was like, yeah, you should try doing more comics. And I went back to my desk and I was like, I'm going to make the fucking funniest comic. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, spite is the best. Fuel. Dude, it was all Grubby was all from revenge. It was all from like, I'm going to be so funny. He's not even going to know what to do. But I went to um, Japan, the world of like everything has a mascot. Everything has a beautiful design. Right. And not saying mm -hmm. Grubby or any of those characters are as close to how well some of those mascots are designed but it was definitely inspiring to see like how simple some of these characters were while i was walking mm -hmm. around japan and just seeing like chip packaging and it's like oh this chip looks so delightful i want to make a chip that delightful you know yeah and they're all they're all just for me like i just try and just be like can i make myself laugh with this and if i do you know i'll put it out there and just try and make somebody's day but you know, it's just like a fun side project that i that i get to do that i didn't do it all 2020 but i'm trying to do again but it's always nice like i see you know gene you comment on them and i'm always like oh like what makes me happy is when my friends comment on them you right. know because it does bring me back to like that high school era where i was making these comics and my friends were like dude this is funny you know yeah mm -hmm. which is what i'm trying to emulate with that honestly i really relate to that i feel like when you have your friends commenting on your work and they're all like wow this is really good and you're like oh i respect and value your opinion oh exactly <laughs> oh my god there is nothing better than a friend texting you be like hey 
that grubby you did today was really funny. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I did it, you know? But it is tough. You want that validation. It's tough because, like, I feel like being funny right now is like pulling out teeth. Like, mm-hmm. it's just not it's just not that fun for me right now. Especially if you're doing a full-time job. Because I, I noticed you stopped doing grubbies while you were boarding on uh, Jellystone, which I I get it. It's like, it's impossible. Yeah, yeah. it's it's hard. But it... Yeah. It's super fun. I'm glad I have it. I think I think everybody, if you're on social media, you should have your... Everyone should have a original character, I think. Yes. It's just... It's so freeing. It's so freeing and it's so fun. And even if you do nothing with it, it's at least something that people can attribute to you, which yeah. is important. I really agree with that. I feel like also, like, that was one thing when I was on Tumblr and I was, like, following people. And then I was just, like, for example, like, Mad- uh, Madeline or Maddie. Oh, Flores? Yeah, she had brave, like uh, Save as Bravest Warrior or Brave Warrior. And I was just so in love with this webcomic. And I was like, I want to be like her. Yes. Or same thing with Aminder and like oh my God, Human yeah. World or like Cyclops. And I was powerhouses. Like, I was like, oh, this is so good. This is what I want to be able to do. I mean, I don't know. And also, I'm like really happy because they're both women. And I'm like, I have women role models. Too. <laughs> Right, yeah. feminism win yeah <laughs> that's amazing no i think i think having people like to look up to in terms of like when you're doing art is so like <laughs> so passionately useful like as soon as you're like oh i've met i've met their level it's like you look for like the next person above you to look to yeah that happens mm-hmm. with me that's so true that is so true i really agree with that yeah. Oh, this is fun. I like just like validating my artistic ideas by Good. with you guys. <laughs> uh, would you ever put together like a collection of grubbies? Yeah, it's it's always tough because I'm always like, as soon as this feels like a project, I won't have fun with it anymore. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, it, that's mm-hmm. just like kind that's of the, true. it's such like a backwards way that I work. It's like, I don't want to put 100% into a project, which is my own detriment. I get it, but I, I think that's actually healthier because I have the opposite problem where I put too much in and then I get burnt out and don't do anything. So it's like, dude, your stuff is so good though. Like, yeah, even if but, you don't finish it, I'm like, I appreciate what's all, what's here. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but it's I, I think in the day of you asked, I you asked about like did memes kill comics, and I don't think they did, but I think I think that social media killed comics without a doubt. Like, yes. without a fucking Ooh. doubt. Yeah, I think that like, I think that web comics were it was like easier to get into it when it was decentralized and you had these like hubs you know like people had their websites or whatever yeah so it's like you would i i remember waking up every morning and checking every single webcomic website that i was you know every webcomic that i liked and it felt like you you had to make that effort but that mm-hmm. also made it more worthwhile when everything is just lumped into content and that's a bigger issue across the board. I mean, even Scorsese is chiming in on it with movies and shit. But it's like, when everything is just content, uh, you could put hours into a webcomic and it gets scrolled past to look at, you know, Big Booby Girl that's next on your feed or <laughs> or or whatever, you know, all respect to Big Booby Girls. I, I follow plenty of them, but it's like... Oh, amen. We respect a good yeah. mommy milker here on this I love it, yeah, show. totally. But it, you do, it's just, it's human nature. You just start, to, when it's just a feed, it's, I mean, that's, it's in the word. Like, you're just getting fed this shit and you, you stop appreciating it and it stops feeling like... Uh, I mean, a gift. Like people are putting effort into it, and it's free. So it's like you should appreciate that it's that it's something that somebody worked hard to make, so you would enjoy it for free. But um, agreed. So that's the thing. I think it's become really hard for people to maintain web comics with, under the, that pressure. And the ones that that excel are usually just like relatable comics, you know. And it's like yes. easy to draw. I won't name any names, though. I have some thoughts, but it's like. <laughs> Oh yeah. They they it's just like well drop my sandwich today. And it's just like and and it's yeah. and then it's like buy my book at the end. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and people and people like it. And so who am I to say? But, but, but not you fucking nailed it. But not all of us not all of us have the ability to to I just don't I wouldn't want to do relatable comedy. I feel like the world, real world is fucking boring and I want to do something that's more interesting. And unless you're going through you're right. the right channels which is pitching which is you know i guess webtoon maybe has been good for serialized like 
fiction. Yeah, because but... I feel like a comic, like the the number one comic on Webtoon is Laura Olympus, and I don't think this comic would have done well on Twitter, mostly because of um... how because of the formula of it, right? Because it's like a soap opera, it's like a, a drama with yeah. a little bit of comedy, but it's definitely not like Shen Comics, who like definitely does these like very meme type of comics, which yeah. can perform really well on every single platform. No, that's true. It, it's interesting. Gene, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think the sentiment behind the phrase memes kill the uh, comics industry is wrong. I think it does feel like an, an old person yelling at a cloud almost. It's like, I'm going to pick what newest thing is. Memes, they killed the comic industry. But I see what you're saying in the way of like memes are these bite-sized things that you, you read and then you move on. Whereas, you know, a comic or something may have taken somebody so long and you digest it and then immediately leave it. But that was always a problem that comics had, you know, yeah. like there's there yes. were memes way back even in the day of people being like, people read my comics in three minutes and it took me like six months to do it, you know. And I think there's and I think memes being the problem is bizarre because comics have always just needed to evolve. Like comics have never had a break. Not only is comics not a very safe industry to be in, it's not easy and it's not, it's and it's not. always changing. And it, there still isn't a great way to do it on the internet because social media doesn't see the value in making sure that comics work well on their platform, mm -hmm. yeah. which it kind of needs. But I don't see, my biggest problem with that statement is that memes are the most fundamentally low barrier to entry form of media or the easiest way to make somebody laugh is a meme. Literally everybody in 2021 can make a meme at any point, at yeah, any mm -hmm. second. It's like, you can yeah. just make it. Whereas to make a comic, like if you want to make a good comic, you got to put in some time. Like there's a lot of barriers to entry to making a comic. However, like there are things like rage comics, which, you know, who knows how long they took to make, but like, mm -hmm. you know, they, they all, but that's the thing. Like you're still using comics with as a low barrier to entry to try and be funny. So I, I have I do have a problem with people like attacking another form of humor to try and make another form of humor seem more important. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. Not that comics oh, are always meant for humor. Yeah, yeah, but... yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I I read that and I was like, you're joking, right? Like it just feels like you're. But I there's there's truths to it. But I think it's a flawed. I think comics need to evolve. I think something needs to happen. Uh, yeah. But I'm not in that industry well enough to know what it is. I like making comics, but like I'm not on Webtoon. Like I just learned so much about Webtoon thanks to you guys yeah. telling me about it. <laughs> but I, I think something does need to happen. Like I think Webtoon's a cool spot, but Webtoon relying on yourself to like market its stuff is a bummer. Well, that's yeah. unless you like pitch a comic and like you have a deal with them. And then it's kind of like, it's very similar to a streaming platform, it, but it's almost like if Netflix had like, their original content and like also author curated content, you know? Yes. Like, oh, that's a great way of putting it's, it. It's like if Netflix also had YouTube on it, basically. Wow. So all the YouTube videos would be like at the very bottom and nobody would watch them except a couple people. What, yeah, I mean, YouTube did that. YouTube has got their original content now. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think it did well. So it, it is interesting that like the how the services kind of break apart and... They, they find a niche for themselves and they can't. I'll be curious to see how Webtoon survives going forward because I I think it's great that they're like funding projects, but. Dude, yeah. it, um, if you spend a little bit of time on the app, I think it's such an interesting app because I feel like it is like the comics revolution that is kind of like, like very similar to the, um, what's the word? Kind of like the formula of the not the shonen jump but like you know the week the weekly yes japanese comics like consistent uploads is that what you're thinking yeah because it's like they have if you go on webtoon and you kind of like scroll through their like uh most popular or whatever mm -hmm. they have one series that a lot of people are subscribed to which is basically the upload for like three days in a row a new ip and people vote on whether or not they want to see it like as a full time webtoon. Damn, that's so tough because some man, like some comics just don't get good until like they hit a stride, you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's so tough yeah. to like just kill something so early. I'm fascinated. I would love to pick your brains about comics anytime. Yeah. This is amazing.
We could do, yeah, well, yeah, hundred percent. I love talking about comics. Sorry, I feel like I hijacked your episode. No, what? <laughs> this was this was so much fun. Oh my gosh, I had a blast. <laughs> I see why you guys do this. This is fun. Well, you're you might be the first uh, person we've had that has a consistent web comic that they're uploading. I'm trying to think. It's it's yeah. I'm trying to think too. I don't think no. Kiki Kiki Flipnote doesn't. It's different. It's a different yeah thing. Oh, we did have Anthony. Anthony Holden did like has. Oh, he a... does consistent comics. Anthony yeah. did. I feel like it's gotten harder and harder on him too, and and it's I don't see him doing as many. And um... no, and then he would do. What's interesting about him too is that he would do the kickstarters at the end to mm -hmm. to sell the books. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work to do comics. It's a hustle. It's a hustle. It's a hustle. Yeah. He does full time, and he does full time storyboarding work. Like he's not—that's not his gig, you know. Like that's see it's just, comics. It's, oh, yeah, I'm gonna. It's unsustainable. I want to talk to you guys about comics. That's amazing. That's so hard. Uh, well, first of all, let's ask yes. about Creative Block. How do you uh, deal with Creative Block when it hits you? What are your uh, coping sort of mechanisms? And also, yes. how does it feel for you when you're in a creative block? Yes. Oh, my gosh. It, the best thing to do during a creative block, the, some of the um, the best thing to do for me during a creative block is to do literally anything else. Hey, that's true. <laughs> you know, is that like the advice you guys mostly get? It's like... Uh, no, we get different advice. It's like, if I don't feel like drawing, I just won't do it. You know, I'm like, oh, I don't want to. I, I won't force it. Because a lot of the times, maybe this is just me overthinking it. But a lot of the times, I think you can kind of tell when somebody had to churn something out you know mm -hmm. yep. it's like you got to sit down and you got to do it i think there's a difference in being unmotivated to do something and then genuinely having like a roadblock in the way of like i can't like i just don't have the mental capacity to do this right now um i think when you have like the latter uh which means like i think if you're doing something and you want to draw, but nothing's coming out well. I think you just kind of got to stick with it until like a good drawing comes out. But I think like if it's just not fun and you're feeling frustrated, I think just do something else. Like have like a like a, a good amount of hobbies to do to keep you occupied. Um, in my experience, that's been the best for me. Like there are days where I just won't draw, but then the next day I'll be encouraged to just draw 24-7. You know, it's yeah, it's kind of like in a wave uh, for me. Uh, we did get some questions at Brandon Hong guest on the show name one video game from each of your favorite console that you'd like to see adapted to screen that might be a loaded one actually this is a little i'll just give one okay i think that would be fun let's see what's my favorite console Ooh, the dreamcast Ooh, mm -hmm. i think on the dreamcast skies of arcadia would be cool have you guys ever oh, seen yeah. skies of arcadia yeah 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 that is a good one yeah it's pirates in the sky that would be fun yeah. um shenmue would be ridiculous but i think shenmue you'd have to like You'd have to go in and pump that up. Like you'd have to make this all of a sudden like a cool one man versus all, an entire gang until he makes it to like the final bad guy that killed your father. You know, I think you kind of like have to pump that up. Uh, Seaman would be ridiculous. Have you guys ever heard of Seaman before? Mm -mm. Seaman is a game that came with the mic. Oh yeah, oh, I know Seaman. I oh perfect. It comes with a microphone and it's basically like a Tamagotchi where like you're raising a pet but he's really sassy and sarcastic. You should look up clips where you're like, hi, C-Man. And he'll just be like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the game. It's really funny. It's a bizarre game. Mm. V, what else should we ask? From at Crumpton, what would be your main recommendations for someone getting into the animation scene as a storyboard artist for the first time? Heck yeah. Um, the only thing I can really speak about is uh, for 2018, I was unemployed. Um, and what I did to try and get a job because obviously like <laughs> you can ask anybody and everybody has a different answer on how they got it but I just kept pumping out storyboard portfolios mm. I just kept thinking of um, of ideas that would be fun for me to like quickly do a board of around 40 panels I think is like the sweet spot and then just mm. putting it out there and sending it to recruiters whenever um, you know if you have their contacts or if uh, a job offer comes up like just make sure that that piece is in your portfolio but the biggest thing um that one of my bosses told me was that when he's looking for people that he wants to hire he just wants to make sure that they're funny so if you want to go into something comedy based just have something funny on your on your twitter account your instagram or whatever that just shows that you're funny so that way it's easy like oh, okay they're funny now can they can they do it because i think uh comedy is the hardest thing to do so if yes. you can if you can show that you can do that, you're set. Yeah, uh, I, I do like this. I like this question from uh, at Frog Little Comics. 
Ian, can you give me advice on continuously being dedicated to a comic? Oh my God. Well, revenge is a good one. That helps. Revenge is the <laughs> best fuel. Yeah. Spite. Revenge, revenge is the best fuel. I think don't fall into my pitfall. I think the biggest thing that I've learned to realize is figure out your characters before you do it. Figure out what you want from it. Like if you just want something that's cool, then sit down and make something cool. If you want something that, that the characters that will eventually go through something, you got to earn that. And if you're going to make a comic of it, then you got to figure you have to have that ready in the beginning. And then whenever you're ready to unleash it, like, so let's say like this character's name is Tim. And then like his dad ends up being like the evil bad guy. You don't, you might just want to save that in your pocket until the end, you know, like just kind of have a list of all the characters attributes mm -hmm. because then you get the hardest part, which is people coming back to read your character. You know, like if people come back because they want to see Rodney do weird shit, you know? So like, mm -hmm. So as long as you can get people to do that, but it's freaking hard as heck. So the real advice is to just have fun. <laughs> if you're having fun, it's worth yeah. it. If you're not having fun anymore, just don't do it. It doesn't matter. You're not getting paid to do it. It's all for fun. Yeah, that's, that's very good really advice, true. I think. What kind of uh, goals do you have for your career and your future? Yes. Oh, my God. I want to keep boarding. I think directing would be fun one day, but I'm chill boarding right now. And then just help my friends get shows. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't have necessarily any stories I necessarily want to tell, but like, I want to work on Gene's show. I want to work on V's show. Like I want to work on everybody's show, you know? I would love that. Oh my God. I would love mm -hmm. to help my friends like get their visions. You know, it's, that just yeah. sounds like so much fun. That's good. Uh, v, did you have anything else? I actually really like this question from at Neapolico. Uh, where do you look for inspiration to write your grobby comics? I'm a big fan of that little fruit. Oh, thanks for reading my comics. The inspiration's all from the inspiration's more like a puzzle. <laughs> I, no. I it it sounds like it because like it sounds like I'm talking up grubby comics more than they are. Like grubby comics are stupid, but they're fun, and that's what I like about it. But like, no way, they're great. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it's one of those things of like, how can I trick the viewer into not seeing the joke coming? I think that's always mm -hmm. what I keep thinking. I'm always like, how do I trick people? And I think that idea alone gives me like the energy to want to keep trying you know like how can i trick people effortlessly to not see where it's headed because i think with a lot of four panel or three panel comics you kind of already have an idea when you read the first panel where it's going yes and i try and avoid that i'm like how can i how can i keep people to re keep people reading it you know even though it's yeah. only four panels <laughs> that's yeah. just where we, we're, that's just where we're at in humanity yeah yeah that is very true. It's a lot to juggle. Yeah. Well, that's the end of this creative block. Thanks to Ian for being our guest and sharing his story. Woo! And thanks to your listeners. Follow us on Twitter. It's at Creative Block, Creative Without the Vowels, where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask our guests. Huge thanks to my sister Clemens for editing the podcast. Woo! Please subscribe. Ooh, yeah. Please subscribe to the channel mm -hmm. if you love our content. I've been your host, Gene. And I was V. Keep being creative, and we'll see you next week. See ya. Bye. Bye.